In the early 1980s, scientists from the Soviet Union and the USA teamed up to do the impossible, clone a woolly mammoth. As written in MIT's technology review, an article was published titled Retrobreeding the Woolly Mammoth. The Soviet-American pair was made up of Dr. Yasmolov, head of veterinary research at the University of Irkutsk, and Dr. James Creek of MIT. Yasmolov acquired ova from a young mammoth that was frozen in ice deep in Siberia and sent it to Dr. James Creek at MIT, who, quote, extracted the nuclear DNA aligned it with similarly prepared DNA from modern elephant sperm and concluded the genetic material was compatible. After a few attempts, they were able to combine the DNA and place the fertilized mammoth ova into Asian elephant cows, creating an elephant-mammoth hybrid, Elephus pseudotherius, or Mammontelephus. The news spread around the world quickly, appearing in over 350 newspapers. But when people wanted to see the Mammontelephus, there was an issue. The paper from MIT was written by Diana Ben-Aaron in 1984 on April 1st. Much to the disappointment of many people around the world, the story was an April Fool's prank. However, clearly the interest was there. On July 5th, 1996, Dolly the Sheep was born and was the first cloned mammal to be created from an adult cell. It was exciting and a controversial moment but Dolly was actually kept under wraps by the Roslyn Institute until February of 1997, when a paper was published in Nature. So it was six months after her birth that the public were made aware of her existence, similar to some creations today. The thing about Dolly is that before she was born, it was thought that adult cells like skin or mammary cells only contained information to perform specific tasks, but the fact that an entirely new sheep was created from a single mammary cell showed that wasn't exactly the case. So the question came, what else could be done? Well, before Dolly was even announced to the world, Japanese researchers Kazufumi Goto of Kagoshima University and Akira Iratani, chairman of genetic engineering of Kinki University in Japan, were in Siberia trying to find well-preserved mammoth remains. Sounds similar to the April Fool story, and in ways it was, but this was a serious attempt. Although at first, they were hoping to do it the other way around. Get sperm from a mammoth bull to combine with an Asian elephant egg. By the way, as some of you probably already know, Asian elephants come up a lot when it comes to cloning mammoths, as they are the closest living relatives. In fact, Asian elephants and mammoths are more closely related than African elephants and Asian elephants. The team didn't quite have success with that method, but throughout the years, the interest around cloning mammoths continued. I mentioned this in a video that I made years ago, that during most of my lifetime, I've noticed articles and news stories popping up every few years about how scientists were only a few years away from bringing back the woolly mammoth. Sometimes it's three years, sometimes it's five years. It's always right around the corner. There are multiple articles, there's this one in 2011 saying we'd have mammoths by 2015 or 2016 at the latest. We didn't get mammoths in 2015, but we did get an article from the New York Times on how the mammoth cometh. But I found articles from the early 2000s to the 90s and some commented under the video that there were even articles in the 70s promising mammoths coming soon. I haven't traced them back that far, but it does seem to be something that's been circulating at least since the 80s. There has always been the promise of mammoths being brought back and that we're only a few years away, which has led people to become skeptical over time. But I think things have changed. In 2021, Colossal Biosciences was founded, and one of their primary goals is something that they call de-extinction. As it states on their website, Extinction is a colossal problem facing the world, and Colossal is the company that's going to fix it. That's quite a bold claim, though they do have some work to show for it. If you have any interest in the subject of de-extinction and bringing back animals, I probably don't need to tell you who Colossal Biosciences are. They've been in the news a lot recently. They made the woolly mice and the dire wolves and are famously trying to bring back the mammoth, thylacine, and dodo. It is interesting to see how they've exploded in the media spotlight in the last four years. When I made the other mammoth video, one year after the company was founded, they certainly made waves, 
But today, you can't even mention the mammoth or the thylacine or the dodo without colossal biosciences being brought into the conversation. I've already made a video about the wolves. They don't contain direwolf DNA, but many comments seem to dispute this. But I'm going directly from what Colossal states on their website and in interviews. They compared the genes of recently recovered direwolf DNA and then made changes to grey wolf DNA to try and match it, creating grey wolves that, as far as Colossal knows, seem to physically resemble the extinct direwolves to some extent. Now yes, Colossal calls them direwolves, but I have yet to see a scientist that isn't involved with Colossal agree with that definition. For example, Jeremy Austin, director of Australian Centre for Ancient DNA, said, quote, That's not a dire wolf under any definition of a species ever. I don't think that this represents de-extinction in any way, shape or form. Adam Boyko, a geneticist from Cornell University, was excited about what they have done, but he did not consider the three pups to be true direwolves. Evolutionary biologist Heather E. Haying stated, this is not a direwolf. Editing a few handfuls of ancient genes into a modern wolf genome does not a direwolf make. And there are many others. I don't like to make absolute statements. There probably are some scientists outside of Colossal who like what happened. But from what I've seen, most seem to be at the very least skeptical. But again, simply looking at the evidence and what Colossal themselves have said, they are more modified grey wolves than anything else. I didn't really get into the criticism in the last direwolf video and mostly just looked at statements from Colossal. And yet, a lot of people had very heated responses, saying like, just shut up, who cares, they look cool, and also saying that the critics and scientists ringing the alarm bells are simply jealous. To try and be fair, I guess it's possible some scientists could be jealous, but I don't think it's fair to dismiss every criticism as jealousy, especially when it comes from those who are presenting a solid argument as to why they aren't direwolves. But anyway, can they bring back mammoths? Well, if you consider the wolves direwolves, then kinda yes, if they can pull off a similar procedure. Otherwise, it sort of depends. But again, it seems like the plan is more to edit the elephant cells to be closer to mammoth genes, or as they say on their website, quote, Use gene editing tools that work like scissors to cut elephant DNA and provide a mammoth sequence to incorporate into elephant cells in the same location. And then edit all relevant genes, 65, to make a cold adapted elephant cell line. It seems like they still haven't decided if an African elephant or Asian elephant will be used as the surrogate. But when they do, 22 months later, assuming everything goes well, a baby hybrid should be born that looks like a mammoth. Of course, there may be a variety of different challenges trying to create a viable embryo and then challenges with it developed in the surrogate elephant without issue. But when is this going to happen? Just a few years. It's right around the corner. In all seriousness, in the video from 2021, I mentioned that they said 2027. But now, the most recent dates I've seen from Colossal say that they hope the first mammoth calf will be born at the end of 2028. So they've pushed it back by about a year, but three years isn't that long. It was three years ago that I made the original video. And also, since then, they have proved that they can make some modified animals. And I think they have probably increased their resources since then. In the old video, I said that they had received 15 million in funding, which was a lot, but I wasn't sure if it would be enough. Well, as of January 2025, they have received 435 million and their valuation was put at $10.2 billion. And that was before they announced the direwolf news. A lot of people have invested a lot of money into bringing back the mammoth. And while in the past, we didn't always have a specific organization to point to, it seems now all eyes and all attention are on this one company. And they have said they can do it, and they've given a timeline. The thing is, even if this calf is born in 2028, if Dolly and the wolves are any indication, it may be a few months after the calf is born before it's announced to the public. And there are some more issues with mammoths, but I have to mention, since clones or modified animals seem to be shadow dropped, are we about to see a thylacine clone or creation or a thing? The closest living relative to the thylacine, according to Colossal, is the fat-tailed Dunnart, 
a small marsupial that Colossal Biosciences has selected as the foundation for their genetic work. Due to the significant size difference between the two animals, Colossal is not relying on a natural surrogacy. Instead, they're developing an artificial uterus and, as of January 2025, have successfully cultured fertilized marsupial embryos past the halfway point of gestation. If progress continues at this pace, the possibility of a living thylacine, or at least a close genetic approximation, or whatever it should be called, making the headlines in 2025 doesn't seem super far-fetched. Maybe they even have a living creature right now, but have yet to announce it. Anyway, with regards to the mammoths, what would be the point of having a mammoth calf be born in 2028, other than it would be cool to see? Well, according to them, the end goal isn't one mammoth, but many mammoths, with the ultimate objective being the release of large mammoth herds into the sub-arctic tundra to restore the ecosystem by converting it back into grassland which could slow climate change by preserving permafrost. A noble goal, but how many mammoths would you need to make a significant dent and reshape the environment? Apparently a lot. According to an interview given to the Financial Times, Colossal plans to create a few dozen mammoths each year, but hopes for a self-sustaining population of thousands. Though in the same article, as well as one in the New York Times, it is estimated that 100,000 or more would be needed to make a significant dent in the environment. That's a lot of mammoths. That's more mammoths than we have Asian elephants, which raises more issues. I want to mention a video created by Wildlife with Gavin that goes into more depth about some of the problems and issues that they may face. But just to highlight a few points, there's no guarantee the hybrids will be fertile. But also, the company will have to use either Asian elephants, which are endangered, or an African bush elephant, which is endangered, or an African forest elephants, which are critically endangered. So, one might wonder, why not pour the resources into cloning some of those elephants instead to increase their numbers? But also, how many elephants will they need to use to get all these mammoth calves? Again, there's no guarantee that the first mammoth clones will be able to breed. I'm not sure if the plan really is to make that many mammoths. I mean, consider the wolves. A lot of the questions have been, are they really dire wolves? But I think another good question is, why did they make these animals? Why did they create them? They are in a fenced off area. They aren't being released into the wild to fill some niche. And yet millions of dollars were spent creating them. For what purpose? Well, when we see all the pictures of them on the Iron Throne with George R. R. Martin holding them, I think the answer is marketing. I think the company sees these animals more as an asset. I mean, it seems they went for more of the fantasy version of direwolves rather than the paleo version. And while the technology can and is being used for other projects to protect living endangered species, what really gets you into the headlines and gets your company valued at $10 billion is probably the mammoths and the dodos and the thylacines and the direwolves. But then what? I mean, let's say it's the 2030s and they made a version of a mammoth, thylacine and dodo. Will they move on to using all the resources on protecting endangered animals? Will that keep investors interested? Will that keep the company in the headlines? Or will they have to de-extinct another animal? And considering the money in it, will other organizations also start de-extincting? I think Colossal filed for a patent on the woolly mammoth, but I don't know if that's worldwide. And even then, is someone going to try and create something else? Maybe a lion with longer canines and call it a Smilodon. There may be zoos in certain parts of the world that would pay good money for something like that. Can you imagine the attendance? And maybe a portion of ticket sales can go to wildlife charity. I know that might sound a bit sarcastic, but maybe there is a net positive there. But then there are pets. Companies could probably make a lot selling extinct animals to the very rich. If people want pet tigers, I'm sure some will want pet saber-toothed tigers. I know saber-toothed tiger isn't the correct term, but I imagine for marketing, there are dark paths that this could go down, and already are going down. There are statements that we no longer need to protect endangered animals, or even consider animals endangered. We can just bring them back. Except, not really, and if the root cause of extinction hasn't been addressed, 
such as habitat loss, than spending millions and millions of dollars to put genetic hybrids back into a depleted habitat will probably just end up in them dying out too. It would probably be a lot easier, cheaper, and most importantly, more effective to stop the animals going extinct in the first place. Of course, Colossal aren't the ones suggesting that. In fact, I've seen them speak out against that in interviews, but they have opened Pandora's box. This technology can and is being used to help endangered species. Colossal is working alongside the University of Melbourne in Australia to help quolls to build up a resistance to the poison of cane toads, which are an invasive species. I actually brought it up on a podcast, but I think I forgot about it. It's not something that really captured the public's attention in the same way as de-extinction. I will leave with this, colossal biosciences can do some impressive things, but I think we should always be a little cautious when it comes to claims of de-extinction and I would hope that they shifted more into the work of preserving the species that haven't gone extinct yet. A big thank you to all my wonderful members and patrons, and thank you for watching.